differences in the field, um, particularly water content and groundwater levels and um, things like that. Um, and then developing small scale physical process models. And by small scale, I mean um, normally the scale of a few meters um, up to you know tens of meters, um, trying to simulate the detailed uh, process responses. Um, in particular, looking at soil moisture processes, shallow groundwater processes, uh, wetland groundwater interactions. Um, I, I got my PhD back in 2008 from Imperial College in London. Um, so just some images of stuff I do. So, um, well, I, I, I like to um, build my numerical models um, to simulate um, processes. And this is an example here of a, just a finite volume model that I wrote to simulate um, groundwater uh, wetland interactions. This is applied in the prairies in St. Denis in Saskatchewan. Um, and uh, as well as the models, we instrument the fields with, um, this, is a, this is a hydroprobe for measuring soil water content. Um, and I have a transect of piezometers at this site. Um, and the model is trying to simulate the water table response um, over the uh, non-frozen period. Um, and that's just an example. Other, other models I use include land surface models, um, such as the Environment Cl and Climate Change Canada model MESH and CLASS. Um, yeah. So, um, and this is just uh, some of the stuff I've done. This is an example of that model um, and just simulating how the, uh, the exchange of water between the wetlands and the groundwater um, in this environment. So um, I'm basically solving a two-dimensional Richards equation model and, it, and it's showing how water is exchanged between the wetland and the groundwater. And this has important implications for um, the flushing of solutes and nutrients from the soils into the wetlands, uh, which is a highly dynamic process in the prairies. Um, and uh, depending on rainfall and snowmelt conditions. And uh, this model is a pretty complicated model. And um, in particular, the way that I parameterize um, the soil properties is uh, it's a dual permeability depth scaled model. So this animation on the right tries to sort of show how the hydraulic properties um, are modified as a continuous function of depth below ground surface. And without going into the details anyway, it's, um, um, it's basically trying to come up with a very detailed representation of the hydraulic properties uh, in a weathered glacial till um, profile. Um, a lot of the work I'm doing at the moment is focused on frozen soils and their, um, the role that they play in partitioning snowmelt between infiltration and runoff um, with massive implications for agriculture with um, the, you know, the, the infiltrating snowpack is the major source of water for crops in the, in the dryland agriculture. Um, and so the complication from a hydrological point of view is that the same snowpack in different years will give you very different outcomes. Um, and it depends on the state of the soil at the time of freezing. And uh, we know that, we've known that for a while, but trying to represent that in physical models is quite complicated. Um, and I think that the, the mesh model, I'm showing here a simulation by the, the, the Environment and Climate Change Canada mesh model and class model, they're combined together, um, that's simulating the change in soil moisture storage. And um, my feeling is that this is a very good model. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's, it does a pretty good job at simulating the seasonal changes in soil storage. Um, and so it could be quite useful if we're thinking about agricultural applications. Uh, what would I like to do see in food water? Well, um, I haven't worked in food before, but um, like I said, I'm, sim I'm working on these models to basically try and improve our simulations of soil moisture. And I think that there's um, very good capacity to take the, the best that we hydrologists can do and um, work with um, people who are interested in crop production um, and try and combine those um, models together. Uh, it's, it's more of a future aspiration than anything like um, one big question for the group to think about. Um, well, I, I think I get bas basically, I think my question would be um, what are our 
capabilities when it comes to simulating or predicting, let's say, um, crop productivity as a function of um, water availability? And can we think about ways to, is, is, is there a need there, let's say, to start with, to improve our, our capabilities? And could we perhaps think about how we might integrate some of the hydrological models that I've been working on with um, the best uh, crop models that we can come up with uh, to do a better job of that? So um, that was rather hastily put together, but that, that, those are my thoughts. So I hope that was okay for five minutes. Uh, that was that was great, Andrew. And um, yeah, so now you can just uh, sort of take over as convener and, and march through the talks and uh, otherwise keep us entertained. And uh, while you're figuring out who speaks next, because I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> um, um, yeah, I agree 100% on the, uh, there it is. I agree 100% on the modeling stuff and I made a broad statement, but yeah. I, uh, looking at a couple of the hydrology, agricultural productivity models, I think is really important. And there's a lot of other, you know, water, food areas that we could get in our models. But I'll be quiet now and let you take over. Okay, thank you, Jay. And um, okay, so um, I'm going to basically stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to ask you in turn to share your screens and give us your five minute presentations. Um, so the next person is Deb. Uh, Debajoti Mondal, and I apologize if I've said that badly. That's fine. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so let me see whether I can share my screen. Yes, I, it looks like I can. Okay, am I sharing my screen? Can anyone confirm? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I feel like it is a nice uh, uh, get together, getting to know each other. I already see what Andrew talked about is very ex exciting. So uh, I'll briefly touch why I so, uh, told that. Anyway, so I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science and I do visualization. Whenever you have data, I love to visualize them. And that is not just to see, but also making some decision by visual exploration. So that's what we call visual analytics. And I'm the director of the visualization geometry and algorithms lab at the Department of Computer Science. And these are the collaborators. Some of the systems and pictures I'll be showing you today uh, are um, the outcome of the collaboration. So what are the tools and methods uh, I am using? Basically, we build tools and methods, uh, not just using them. Basically, we call them visual analytic systems. So here are some examples on the top. You can see the soil moisture plot. You can uh, change the contour thresholds. Uh, you can examine the highest rate of change, or you can uh, examine similar regions and what is happening over time by interactively exploring the visualization. And on the uh, bottom one, you can see I selected a uh, rectangular region that covers Saskatoon. I don't know whether you can see my mouse, but if you see that uh, the mean temperature has a trend where in the summer you have the peak and you can see the opposite trend for relative humidity, whereas, oh, sorry, whereas you can see the precipitation is actually uh, very variable in the summer uh, term. Yeah. So you can interactively explore all these when you have a visualization systems and what sort of programming languages we use. We basically from computer science, so all common programming languages uh, that depends on your data or the system that you are already using, whether you need more features onto your system and so on. Uh, the methods we are using is big data computing, geospatial processing and network algorithms. Sometimes for rendering the visualization, you need CPU computing so that you can make it fast. So these are some um, approaches we take. What I have done recently, I am only talking about food water related research. Uh, I don't know how much related there, but I believe they're useful because I'm very much interested in detecting a small change because when you have time-lapse videos, you are interested in seeing what is going on and what will happen in the future. So if you have videos of five, 10 years of Greenland ice melting, then you can actually show the gradient uh, of change where uh, the ice has melted 
the most. And the same thing you can do also for the root structure when you have time lapse video of the growing roots, you can see how the roots are enforcing uh, force on the soil. So you can uh, see lots of noise over here, but uh, after you do some processing, you can really get the vectors and plot and do some further analysis based on that. And these are important when it comes to deep learning models because uh, you always try to find out the signature. I have also worked on big data computing where you want to reduce the client, uh, client server load when you want to query remote data and build a visualization on your local uh, computer. So uh, it, it makes it fast. And what are some of the things I'm currently doing is um, uh, there is this problem with the deep learning model is it is being used as a black box. So how can you trust such a black box? So we are trying to do um, assign the components of the architecture to different tasks and trying to relate the computational process so that at the end you can not only classify but also tell that why it classified in that way and also you can make it more reliable and robust. Uh, and uh, here is another example on the bottom. You can see a new visualization for the meteorological data. Uh, on the left, probably some of you know that uh, this is weather fronts visualized in uh, NOAA Visualization Center. And then uh, if you uh, use our methods, then you can see the fronts are kindly visible. The potential locations are more uh, easily understandable. What I'm looking forward is uh, more open data and with use cases, because if you really want to do interdisciplinary research, you have to have a good connection. So not only data, you have to also tell the, uh, what are the use cases are associated with your data. We need user groups because for knowledge transfer, it is uh, very important to evaluate the existing systems and whether they are useful or I am going along a direction that you do, don't want. So uh, communication is very important. And since we are in big data, I ideally really love to see large data-driven decision-making and that may go to satellite imagery and also lots of genetic data, uh, petabytes of data. And of course, that means interaction among multiple sources of data because otherwise the research will be too uh, segregated. So we want to combine things. A big question that might initiate collaboration with you is how uh, you think an ideal visualization would look like on the data that you are dealing with. So uh, I think that's a very nice question. If we try to answer that, we might um, uh, come, out, come up with some new visualization techniques and collaboration scopes. That's all, thanks. Get back to Andrew. Thank you very much. Did you, did you mention how long you've been with us at the university? Uh, not really, sorry. I am uh, about three years. Okay. Not so Thank long. You. Have you so been hiding? Have... Where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> I have been in computer science. <laughs> wow. Okay. Oh, Let's, but was... uh, thanks, Jay. I loved your presentation last in the previous session. Oh, thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, over to. Uh, well, I'm holding discussion till the end. Okay. So we'll we'll go to Dave Schneider now next. See you, Dave, but I don't hear you at this point. Hey, Dave, you're on mute. Maybe Dave wants us to speak for him. <laughs> I see he's not muted, but... Um... Can you, can you hear me? Yes. yes. That's it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. Um, thank you for the chances to speak. I'm a faculty member in the School for the Environment and Sustainability. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary uh, computational scientist, um, also known as a bottom feeder. I depend on uh, everybody else for, for data. In the past, I've worked in a variety of areas, but uh, I think for this discussion, my work in the area of um, biology in general is probably most, um, most relevant. Um, I've worked on a, a variety of problems related to plant microbe interactions, the spread of infectious diseases, uh, bioinformatics, and functional genomics. And more recently with Leon, uh, working on the genetic environmental uh, determinants of root system architecture in, in crop plants. 
Um, I'm kind of an applied mathematician by, by temperament. Um, I use uh, stochastic processes and stochastic methods, especially those uh, that involve time-dependent transition probabilities to model complex systems. Um, I'm very interested in the idea of data analysis, and that is instead of using um, something like a total root length as a phenotype for plants, but to use functions, and in particular, potentially using um, uh, probability distributions as phenotypes. Um, and that's connected to the, the work I've been doing recently in optimal transport theory. I continue to be involved in various aspects of uh, bioinformatics, looking at differential gene expression and a protein expression, uh, both in plants and in, and in native species in response to um, aquatic uh, toxins, and also collaborating um, with various faculty on uh, plant uh, root microbe interactions. So uh, what I've done since arriving here in Saskatoon in 2017 is uh, working on uh, abiotic stress responses and um, uh, soil microbe interactions with, with Leon and Bobby Helgeson, using uh, probabilistic methods to characterize root system architectures, um, looking at native, like I said, native fish species response to environmental toxins, and um, on and off again, collaborating with Jeff McDonald on the use of stable isotopes to monitor water uptake. Um, what I'm doing now is um, using these stochastic methods to characterize root system architectures. On the right hand side, you'll see a sorghum plant, which is the which is the dark, um, which is the black, and uh, and some circles, and those represent randomly chosen um, uh, points. That in this case, just a hundred. Um, and then the the method that I'm using, one of the methods that I'm using to characterize roots, is asking the question: If you lay down a collection of randomly located points, how far do you have to travel to you first encounter a root? This is actually a, a variant of something that's commonly done in ecology to characterize landscapes and um, habitats. And it's not previously been used to characterize other complicated shapes like roots. And it turns out that this is a very powerful methodology. Um, the, cha the challenge is, is that um, one gets a function rather than a number as the output, and therefore one has to um, use different statistical methodologies. One of the intriguing parts of this um, work is that um, it really um, identifies structure at all scales. Um, and the other major activity that I'm involved in is collaborating, like I said, with Bobby and, and Leon on root soil microbe interactions, in particular looking at the response of canola and the, the canola microbiome um, in response to phosphorus uh, limitations. So what would I like to do or see in the area of food and water? I think that it would be helpful if we took a bigger view and focused on problems rather than tools or methods. Um, I think it remains a challenge to uh, integrate data across uh, temporal and spatial scales. Um, each of these uh, different um, scales has a different community associated with them. And um, I think there's a very, very big problem, and that is dealing with uncertainty in all of our measurements and um, in future predictions. So integrating the uh, idea of, of food production, weather, and weather uh, climate change uh, variation in, in those weather patterns, and integrating economics to be able to have um, uh, decision support tools. Um, and I think that one of the best things that we could do as a group across campus is focus on things that we can't do individually. And one of those things is to create robust data-driven decision support tools at every stage, uh, at every scale. So producers may not be interested in what happens in Alberta. They're interested in their own fields. Um, remote communities, for instance, in the north, um, have a very limited food shed, and they need to be mo much more self-sufficient and focus on remote or on on, on local resources. Provincial um, uh, uh, government 
needs to needs to look at a, at a bigger picture and certainly the national international stage is important also because uh, what we do um, might have applications in other areas but um, I, I guess just I think it would be helpful to us to to really look at a, an outcome based um, an assessment of, of our collaboration here and one of the ways of delivering something would be to develop these uh, data-driven support tools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. That was very nice, very clear. Um, I'm going to keep going. So um, I would invite uh, Jeff Chenau to, to uh, speak. Sorry for the name pronunciation there. Thanks, uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, I'm getting a message. I cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Okay, oh. sorry about that. Uh, can everybody see and and hear me now? Uh, your screen's not up yet. Okay. Try putting it now. Okay, I'm going to go back. Let's see. I'll hit share screen. Ah, share. You got it now? Yes. Excellent. Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so folks, I'm a professor in the uh, Department of Soil Science, and I also hold the Ministry of Agriculture Chair in Soil Nutrient Management. Uh, I've done teaching research extension on management of ag soils for over 30 years at the University of Saskatchewan. And I've also been a farmer for 43 years. And my main interest is in nutrients, uh, both fertilizers and manures. And so certainly working along the lines of Jian and, and Haven, who we heard from earlier on this morning. My program also encompasses a little bit beyond that as well, looking at soil active herbicides, soil management practices like tillage, crop rotation. I have an interest in salinity and also uh, to a certain extent how all of that ties into water as well. So I'm really looking at folks, soil management for agronomic, economic, environmental benefit, really wanting to get those nutrients into the plant, not somewhere else. So my adage is always use those nutrients, don't lose them. And to that end, a very important emphasis of mine is on 4R nutrient stewardship, right source, right rate, right time, and right place. So the kind of tools and methods I'm using, uh, I do a lot of field research, and that includes both small, small plot work and field scale. So I have my farm at Central Butte that I use for both small plot and uh, a landscape scale type studies, as well as university lands like the Livestock Forage Center of Excellence, uh, and also work with folks at Agriculture Agri-Food Canada and uh, AgriArm Sites Provincial Ones as well. You might wonder, how do I do a water type runoff work on small plot uh, type studies? Well, one of the techniques we do, I'm showing there at the bottom, is we take intact slabs of soil out. We do simulated snow melt runoff and use that as an assessment wet method, as well as the more traditional uh, watershed basin type techniques. In the lab, we use chemical, spectroscopic, and also isotope techniques. What have I done recently in water quality? Well, looking at manure and fertilizer, one of the things is placement. So we compared broadcast versus in-soil placement for manure, in-soil placement helps. Uh, for fertilizer, in-soil placement certainly superior. So certainly some challenges there with, uh, with manure and, and how we can best utilize it and minimize uh, runoff issues. So what I'm doing right now in relation to some of that is some variable rate precision cattle manure application work with other folks at the U of S and also the uh, 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 National Water Research Institute, uh, really showing so far that staying out of those slows, reduce, slews, reducing the rate in low spots is showing some agronomic benefits and also some environmental ones, including reducing the nutrient concentration in the water. Uh, some work that we're just getting going on is uh, using strategies like implementing forages, variable rate application, shallow tillage to reduce nutrient export in water that's coming out of drain sloughs where there's an attempt to consolidate all of the water in a landscape in one place. And so that's going on out at Lanigan at the uh, Discovery Farm. 
what I'd like to do or see in food water. I think I get lots of questions from growers continuing on about soil salinity. How can we manage land use and water to, to help control that? And I think we've also heard a lot about today already, the, the need to couple both water and nutrient use efficiency together. How can we best manage, ma manage that in our new cropping tillage systems? Also dry land versus irrigation. I think we're gonna see more irrigation coming down the road here in Saskatchewan. And how can we do the best job with both water and nutrients? And finally, one big question for the group to, to think about, I think really is how can we ensure continued uh, economic viability of our egg uh, industry, our producers, while maintaining improving water quantity and quality in Saskatchewan. I think that's an, an important challenge and, and what novel tools and strategies can we employ that are going to help everyone out there. So that's my presentation, Andrew. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thanks very much, Jim. Um, I'm going to continue to hold comments till the end. So um, can I invite uh, Andrea to give us a presentation next? Hi, I'm just setting up. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Now I'm just going to see how I'm going to share this. So I've got two screens working. So bear with me here so that I could um, get. Or... Is that, is, am I looking at your screen now or am I looking at? I think, uh, Jeff, Jeff, I think we're still looking oh. at your screen. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jeff, you need to stop there, sharing this. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Okay, that'll, yeah, that's going to help me here. Okay, let's see if this works. Hit share. I might lose you, but if you can see my screen, then I know I'm doing my job. Can you see? Uh, no, I think it's gone too. Yeah, that's it. We got it. You've got it? Perfect. Okay. This is the first time this is working for me where I can see everyone plus my screen. So, all right, I'm Andrea and I'm an assistant professor at the School of Environment and Sustainability. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna click to my next slide here. Oh. Is that working? Cause uh, it's not, oh, there, I'm a, I have a delay, I guess. Uh, so I'm a new faculty member. I joined SENS in March 2020. Uh, my background, I have three degrees in mechanical uh, engineering, specifically started in, back in aerospace and evolving, taking my aerospace knowledge, applying it to wind turbines, and then growing that into renewable energy. And um, I gave a TED Talk a couple, few years ago now uh, about smart cities begin with you. And that's my passion on how do we incorporate different renewable energy so that uh, we can have a smart grid or a, a way that we can live more efficiently um, with the energy that we use from generation and also storage to how we make everything work. So uh, that's where I'm coming from, from that perspective. So the tools and methods that I use are really interdisciplinary because I, I'm across the whole broad spectrum of renewable energy. Um, and storage, I'm looking at all types of weather, I'm looking at natural resources, but I discovered in my work that I can't get a lot along the way in the technology if I don't have policy to support the work because it is so integrated to the land and to the people and to the communities where these projects are implemented. So I spent a lot of time um, working in energy policy as well to understand how I could better implement technology. And of course this brought in economics and uh, community applications. So it, on the scientific part of my work and in my research, I use uh, multi-objective evolutionary optimization. So I use a lot of computational optimization and modeling of different energy systems. And I've developed a simulation and um, uh, tool to also be able to uh, optimize and view what you're doing with your energy in real time implementing all these different sorts of renewable energy systems. Um, and the point here is to help re uh, remote communities or those such as like islands um, become autonomous uh, to help them in their own energy sovereignty, as well as to have uh, the most effective and efficient use of distributed power generation. And this is really stemmed out of the work of uh, helping to serve those who live in non electrified areas in um, Latin America in South America is where I really discovered this is issue, but I brought it back home. I'm from Manitoba and we had a lot of issues with our First Nations communities not having um, a grid and being uh, stuck on very expensive diesel power. So I took my work and my research to apply it uh, into my community and into the Northern communities in my backyard. And so this led to working with uh, indigenous uh, communities so that they could use technology for social change as well. And now, 
what I have done. So I've mentioned a little bit about uh, smart microgrids and that work being applied in a Brazilian island uh, is my reference to South America. And it was taking this island from being 100% diesel and making it um, have an energy plan that could take it to be 100% renewable energy. And this was significant because of the cost of electricity and the poverty that was uh, experienced there. But because energy serves so many parts of what we do, uh, it takes in everything. So whatever like you're using your energy, if it's going to be growing your food or purifying your water or anything like this, energy is somehow always involved. So this is where I see that fit coming in with um, the food water nexus and hopefully we can expand it to that food water energy nexus. Uh, previous to that I spent a lot of time um, developing new and novel icing mitigation techniques for wind turbines and cold climates and I have also done a lot of industrial applications being a professional engineer. I've also um, worked in entrepreneurship and businesses and setting up communities to have their own um, cooperative wind energy business so that they could be empowered and have econ local economic development. And so I've also um, done solar photovoltaic installations through my own um, uh, activities and business work. Now, what I am doing now is leading the development of the energy security specialization in the Masters of Sustainability program at SENS. I'm developing best practices in sustainable deployment of renewable energy projects for communities and increasing that renewable energy ratio for remote communities via what I call smart microgrids. So taking that microgrid model, using optimization and computer modeling to make it smart, like a smart grid, bringing that together and applying it in these remote communities so that they could get to the next level of um, what is most effective and, and, and hopefully get on with it, but also empowering women in the process because there's not enough women in the energy se sector and it's a little bit lonely sometimes. So <laughs> it's always great to have other women involved um, and, and see them thrive. <clears throat> what I would like to see is um, more of an implementation of an integrated systems approach to energy for supporting that food water nexus energy part of it as well. Um, and I'd like to see this applied in community energy development in remote and indigenous communities. There's a lot of issues outside of energy with food, with water in those communities that we serve. So I think there's a real opportunity to Build that all together. And I do want to extend this work into the development of smart cities, which is another area where I apply my work. So the big question I have for the group is, uh, given that energy is necessary for life, where from a systems perspective, have you considered energy to fit into the food water nexus? And then some sub questions to that are just, what are those integration points where that energy would fit in? Uh, what kind of energy is needed to support what we want to do with the food water nexus and uh, possibly what could be done with the food waste conversion to the energy economy. And that's all. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so the next scheduled speaker is not here. So we're going to go next to um, Sok Bum. I hope I'm, I'm probably getting the name wrong. I apologize again. Um, we're not getting any audio at this point. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, that's it. Okay, all right. Um, um, this is Sokbom Go. I'm sorry that I don't have a camera with me in my laptop in my office. I was so bored of being home so long, so I came to my office on campus, but I forgot to bring my laptop. But anyway, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, sounds good. This is Sokbom Go from Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. I'm also associated with the Division of Biomedical Engineering. Okay, um, I did my PhD at the University of Rhode Island and since 2002, I'm working um, as a faculty at the Department of ECE and the Division of Biomedical Engineering. My research interests include the deep learning and its application and the Internet of Things the sensors and data analytics and um, efficient hardware implementation of any kind of compute intensive applications. I'm so interested in that, that's my passion and biomedical engineering. In terms of tools and method that uh, my lab is using, um, we are working on deep learning at uh, various uh, levels. Uh, as a subset of the DL applications, we are 
we deal with the um, various sensors, some um, chemical sensor, temperature, RGB, HSI, cameras, biomedical images, um, including CT, ultrasound, and MRI, and intelligent transportation um, sensors. We use a local and uh, remote and cloud servers equipped with uh, high performance GPUs, as well as a dedicated circuits such as uh, a PGA sponsored by Intel and Xilinx and other um, uh, tools are sponsored by uh, the big name uh, industry, NVIDIA and Microsoft as well. What I've done, uh, with respect to water and um, food, um, first one is uh, we try to predict the yield uh, in aeroponics and try to interpret the, the data appropriately. So which and how features contribute to predictions. And these data are collected by the uh, local company Farm Boys and we um, developed a model uh, to predict the yield. Predict, uh, yield. The next one is a Brassica Cartinata Emergence Object Detection and Counting. We used a combination of uh, uh, different object detection method paired with uh, different counting method. So the slide shows some object detection part examples. Uh, we also developed the camera on a stick in the field, uh, which can capture images at five minute intervals, 24 hours a day, over the full growing season. And this one shows some pictures of the, the prototype that we deployed in the field. What I'm currently doing is we try to predict the moisture in canola and wit using um, hyperspectral images. So as you can see from this one, the samples are fed into two uh, models that we uh, revised and modified. Um, we break down the HSI into spectral and spatial uh, component. And uh, later we um, combine together using ensemble method and using SHEP, how we try to interpret the data. Water um, project, we uh, are working on WDPM model. Basically uh, this one is developed using only one CPU. And we try to see how much performance improvement that we can get uh, using GPU and the multiple number of GPUs. And preliminary results show the obviously good uh, performance improvement. The next step is to um, implement this one into FPGA, um, uh, which is the, the hardware platform. What I'd like to see in food water, um, uh, deep learning application at the edge side so that we can process data on site in real time. And by doing so, more information can be processed using uh, fewer resources. One big question, uh, did I mention uh, energy somewhere? Oh, here you go, potential energy. I'm so glad that, um, you know, Andrea brought this one. I think um, energy, food, and um, water would be a good combination in, in terms of nexus. So uh, my big question to the group is, um, we are suffering with the uh, internet access limitation. So can we use, um, the, the new technology such as the LoRaWAN. LoRaWAN stands for Long Range uh, Wide Area Network. And also our team can adapt the sensor to extreme weather conditions. Um, the other one is um, all the challenges that climate change is going to impose in our models, observations and known patterns. So perhaps studying other latitudes uh, would be an option. Uh, in case you I'm um, wondering how I look like this is me. Okay, this is what I prepared. Thanks everyone. I look forward to discuss more at the end of the session. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, pressing on as we will try and leave some time for discussion. Um, the next speaker is Sarah. Hi everyone. Um, Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Do you see this? Yes. Okay, great. Um, all right. 
So good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Sadri. I'm a relatively new member of uh, Jay's Familiarity Group. Um, I am a research scientist, and my talk today is about application of remote sensing data in monitoring and forecasting for water security relevant to um, significance of agriculture in the Canadian prairies and northern communities. So who am I? I just show you some photos. Um, I started my undergrad in um, irrigation and drainage engineering um, in University of Tehran. Then I came to Canada. I did my master's and uh, PhD in uh, University of Manitoba and Waterloo in civil engineering. I traveled a little bit, worked for the UN system um, and also um, in uh, industry. And then I went to Princeton and stayed there pretty much uh, up until the time that I joined Jay's group. Um, so uh, I've been around and some, there have been some uh, pivotal moments that shaped my um, research uh, attitude or ideas. Um, I have been also active in uh, some aspect of science communication. Some of the films that are made in Africa or photography won awards by UNESCO or won the first prize awards in uh, art of science communication. So uh, this is this is what I'm, I was passionate about and uh, also what I like about Jay's group as well. Um, so um, I'm a statistical and remote sensing hydrologist with the irrigation engineering background. And I want if I want to put an umbrella over um, topics that I'm most interested in is uh, any and regional or global uh, food water security projects that is um, simple, understandable, and actionable. It's really of my interest. Tools I use for that are remote sensing data. These are sensors that are mounted on satellites that orbit around the Earth and give us information about available water, uh, especially in remote areas of the globe, which is very attractive option for um, compensating the lack of access we have to those places. I also use a lot of statistical and stochastic analysis, machine learning, and mostly um, programming in R. But as needed, I use other tools and programming as well. And most of the codes that I write is uh, to develop a statistical model. But for validation, I use other physical models, such as variable infiltration capacity, like VIC, that is pretty well known. Also, on my own time, I develop vertical farms. Uh, these, are, these are like 100% self-feeding uh, farms that work on timers and they recycle water. I think there is a future for that. And that's the reason um, that I put it in my talk, because I, I'm, I want to see whether there is any genuine interest to take it to the next level at USASC. So uh, my past work, I chose to talk about my past publication uh, that Jay also is a co-author on that. And it's a project funded by NASA that um, was about developing a global near real-time soil moisture index uh, using integrated SMOS and SMAP data. So I integrated this data to have a longer term uh, data for calibration. Um, and. Uh, um, and then for every 36 kilometer grid on Earth, um, I fit a beta distribution to the data. This is an example of a grid point in Saskatchewan. And uh, use an, I used an asymptotic approach to extend the tails of distribution to take care of those unseen drought and flood events, and then uh, translated the probability percentiles into a standard color coded of uh, showing pluvial and uh, drought conditions. So on daily basis, a map like that is generated through this algorithm and is overlaid on uh, Google Maps. Um, this is um, very uh, valuable because it, it gives us the opportunity to develop this into one further a step, which is a prediction model for uh, identifying early droughts and pluvial conditions or waterlogged conditions. Currently, I'm taking this uh, combination of a statistical approach and remote sensing in near real time one step further to uh, use it for application of farmers. Um, I chose, for example, four, four farms around Canaston and, uh, and the Saskatchewan area, and also two farms in uh, around uh, Carmen in Manitoba. And the idea is to inform farmers about the amount of irrigation needed for the following week. And to do that, we need to predict uh, Ev evapotranspiration, the base evapotranspiration and irrigation needed. Um, and for that, I use various statistical approach for downscaling the um, surrounding near real time uh, remote sensing data from various sources into the farm and also uh, decide on where the irrigation amount needs to be distributed, especially. So one preliminary result of this was but just by looking at the ET and uh, um, ET over ET 
CT0, which is translated to crop water stress over um, S4, S1 farm, uh, southwest of uh, Keniston, um, shows that in most of the time for every year, for ag during agriculture year, the series of um, crop water stress was above the actual ET stress, um, ET or evapotranspiration, meaning that it's not um, far from imagination that at some point near future, the rain fed farms in Saskatchewan also need to go under the automa uh, automatic or um, uh, machinery for irrigation. Some other uh, results of that is, for example, if we assume that today is 1st of July 2019, and uh, then the only information we have for the following week is the precipitation, which is pretty accurate in most parts of the world. And uh, with that, I can uh, predict um, uh, the amount of um, irrigation for compensation of lack of rain, also ET and ET0. Um, you, this is done using random forests like machine learning techniques. Um, also, um, the uh, data is downscaled, as I mentioned, into um, just a farm to distribute the water, to show where the water desirrigation needs to be distributed. And there are a lot of other questions around it, but for the interest of time, I, I will um, continue with my slides. What I would like to see in food and water is, uh, first of all, I want, I like to, uh, to translate my data into an app so that the farmer can use it directly on daily basis. Uh, I think in general, uh, using digital agriculture uh, is very, very important um, to, uh, to, to focus on, especially with the projection of the cl uh, climate change in the future, um, population growth, farmers are more and more under pressure to produce more with the same amount of land with this, without any increase of water. Um, so uh, this is something to really uh, focus on. The other thing is uh, helping northern communities uh, with physical solutions such as this uh, vertical farm or indoor farming. There, there has been um, um, activities like that, but mostly with commercial interest or business interest. And I think somewhere like USASC is in a very good spot to pick it up and answer um, questions that are academic and scientific around this uh, kind of activities. Um, also, I do think that policy is really important for food security um, of um, northern communities, but it, it's never going to be replacing the physical solutions like that. So um, questions that I have from the group, for, um, I prepared this before I really get to see half of this talk. So um, uh, I apologize for that because I already put down some names to contact, uh, such as Jeff's name and Melissa. Um, I really like to uh, be in touch with a farmer uh, that uh, can give us feedback on this project about the product that we are developing so that the product that is finally developed is not far from what farmer needs. So that if you can discuss that with me, I really appreciate it. If you have any other institute data or models that you think it would be good to incorporate with this model would be fantastic to know about. Also, um, I want to know really if there is any genuine interest in that uh, indoor farming project as well. With that, I thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Sarah. Very nice. And uh, lots of lots of work going on there. Um, so we'll move to our last speaker, uh, Chitra. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I'll start sharing my screen. Can you see? Um, yes. Okay. So my name is Chitra Karunakaran. I am a science manager at the Canadian Light Source. Who am I? I am an agricultural engineer by training, graduated from University of Manitoba in 2003 with a PhD, and have been working at the Canadian Light Source since 2015. So I'm not a real faculty. I am a, a scientist at the Canadian Light Source, but I have adjunct faculty positions at the University of Saskatchewan and University of Manitoba. So what I'm my do and what is my passion? My passion is promoting the use of synchrotron techniques for agriculture research. Uh, if we remember, Professor Peter Phillips mentioned that these research institutes or national facilities can exist, but unless we reach out to the community to understand what the exact problems are, are practical problems and how these tools can be used to solve the problems, 
uh, that's really important. So my role for the last five years at the Canadian Light Source is to actively engage with the community, understand the problem and see whether the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron could be used to solve the problems. Uh, what are the tools or methods I use? As of course, I come from the Canadian Light Source. I use all the tools available at the Canadian Light Source. The first one is X-ray microtomography or 3D imaging. It's a non-destructive imaging. So for example, if you take, if you are doing modeling and you want to look at the porosity, porosity connectivity in soil cores, you can look at low resolution images using hospital X-rays. But at the Canadian Light Source, we can, we can do high resolution images at the micron or nanoscales of the soil cores. And here is an example of image taken with the soil and root system. And we can do all calculations on the porosity of the soil, root volume, root surface area, root architecture without destroying the sample. So that's an example. Another application is X-ray absorption or fluorescent spectroscopy or microscopy. Here is an example of copper, the dark color red means more copper in a plant uh, leaf uh, grown near a uh, copper mine for phytoremediation uh, work. So we can, uh, we can map the, at the spatial resolution of micron or nano scales of elements or compounds uh, at different resolutions using the synchrotron. Another application is it's not just uh, mapping an element like copper, but what form of copper is important and that you can never do with a lab source. Um, so is it water soluble copper or water insoluble copper? So those things. So we talk a lot about nutrients and interaction with soil or water. That's where the synchrotron may play a role. Also the mid infrared uh, spectroscopy or spectrum uh, microscopy. So here you see an example of a cross section of a bud and we mapped the, um, the compound called pectin which acts as a barrier so the buds are uh, uh, surviving through the winter and they can grow. What I have done, so uh, I use the synchrotron techniques for agriculture research and have shown this application for the last five years to lots of researchers at the University of Saskatchewan, Global Institute for Food Security, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and NRC. Uh, but right now we are promoting the use of this uh, national research facility to researchers outside Saskatchewan because it's a national facility and it has open access to uh, researchers across Canada. So that's what I am doing. What I like to see, um, there is a lot of this national facility is also open to international researchers. So you can go and see the applications in lightsource.ca. Uh, here is an example on uh, application to look at water quality. So these are researchers coming all the way from University of Wyoming uh, to look at water quality. I like to see uh, more uh, work from the Canadian uh, researchers on water quality in uh, using the Canadian light source. So the big question is, um, there are, this is uh, Canadian Light Source is a national research facility. We have excellent expertise as we are seeing through the presentations. We have lots of research centers like GIFs and Water uh, Research Institute. How can we all work together and solve Canadian or world problems? So how can we connect the dots? One of the challenge that we have best tools and best people, but sometimes it's very hard. We don't talk uh, to each other quite often. So recently, this is an example, uh, Professor Leon Kochi, and he hired a postdoc who is working at the GIFs, but he will use cyclotron and synchrotron to solve the problem related to food security. So similar things we can do for water security, water quality related problems. And uh, if you want to know more about what I showed here, this is the website. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Chitra. So um, I think, uh, Jay, feel free to jump in, but... Um, I, or... I'm, I'm jumping, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, so Andrew, I know you were teaching this morning, but we decided to go ahead and, and you know, take the time, take 10, 15 minutes to, uh, to ask questions or make comments or whatever. Yeah. I was just, I just reflection quickly, um, you know, I think this is so, such, so valuable to see the range of high quality work that's happening at the university here. 
Um, you know, interesting point here, D Dave Schneider challenged us to think about the range of scales. And we, we've looked today at um, the, uh, the synchrotron imaging, at, you know, micron scales and below, I guess. And then we've looked at remote sensing imaging at the global scale. Um, we've heard about people working on hydrological modeling at various scales. Um, Sarah looking at very large scale models, me small scale. Um, we've got Jeff uh, doing, you know, on the ground, looking at how the, the systems work and how the runoff works, looking at nutrients and so on. Um, and, uh, and then we've got some very uh, high level computational methods, data visualization um, and uh, model optimization, I guess, um, from some of the computer scientists and electrical engineers, uh, Debat Jokti and uh, Sokbum. So um, a really, really nice range of talks. Um, I wonder if we could maybe take Dave's challenge and think about the problems that we 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 might um, find in common uh, that we could work on together. So maybe that would be a nice place to start the discussion. If anybody wants to jump in on that. Let's just leave some uh, let's leave some dead air for a little bit, uh, um, Andrew, and see if anyone because you know. We're always going to jump in, but I, I would like to hear what other people have to say. Please think about it. I'm Can only I, I'm only going to jump Jeopardy in. Clock. Oh, go oh, ahead, Andrea. Well, I'm just jumping in because I have to run to another meeting. But um, I just wanted to say that um, for me, it, like energy is connects a lot of the dots when we're looking at implementing food in remote communities and water. Uh, it's like, how are we going to power anything that we do? So um, if anyone is interested in connecting with me, just uh, I have to run, but I'm sorry. <laughs> um, please connect with me. Just send me an email. And thank you so much for this uh, this time. Thanks, Andrea. I'd like to just jump in quickly. The uh, um, Dave showed a, a very interesting and good metrology that he uses. This random-based walk that, that 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 identifies root systems at all scales. It's enormously exciting to me, and I think that 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 um, that that, uh, that 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 work that 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 Dave is doing is going to have uh, huge applications at, at at all scales because. It, it, it allows you to identify features of, of uh, features of things without knowing precisely uh, how big they are, and 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 you know and and and, and it really uh, I'm excited because one of the big problems when you're doing um, uh, 3D imaging with 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 synchrotron and other techniques is segmentation, and uh, I think that Dave's technology. Uh, renders that question almost null and void. You don't need to segment anymore. You just need the image uh, 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 once he's done. So anyway, I'm, I'm just trying to say I'm, I'm enthusiastic and I hope other people uh, can see some of the powers of Dave's, of Dave's work. Thanks, Emil. I, I think I, uh, I enjoyed today's session very much. I didn't realize that <laughs> some of the things could be that much impactful. I think there is Dave uh, also talked about uh, the root structure that uh, that uh, very much aligns with my work. So I really see some collaboration scope. I also liked uh, Sarah's talk about building an app for the general public. And one, one thing that always I think like when you make some of this, uh, you really need to work with the farmers and then how you promote that they will use it. And, and the initi initiation and maintaining the app is very much challenging because you really need also collaboration with industrial people because as a research scientist, are you responsible for maintaining the app? So, so all these questions requires thoughts and uh, really bringing uh, right people into it so that uh, it, it eventually makes uh, like becomes a success. So yeah, I, I, I'm very much enthusiastic to join this because really I didn't expect so many people with so many thoughts. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, great to know because I put down your name as well to reach out. I think it would be very helpful. Um, with regard to the app, um, right now we are still um, data crunching basically to 
build a system and um, something that is functional, even um, if it can put it online, just on a website. And if it I, um, I can work like with the, some demos, that would be like fantastic. But eventually, I, I think over um, one year or two, it should become an app. So that's the direction we are going to. And uh, I really appreciate your feedback because we do need expertise on um, all the ropes that are required for maintaining the app and make it useful. And yes, we do need to work with the farmers so they actually um, tell us what they need and, you know, in different aspects of variables and covariates that they need to, to see um, to make a better decision about the irrigation or the profitability of the crop they are choosing for that year, et cetera, et cetera. Andrew, Leon wants to say something. I think he raised a hand. So. Please, yes, sorry, I can't see raised hands. Please just jump in. Um. Well, yeah, Jay thinks I talk too much, so I, I thought I'd be polite and raise my hand <laughs> before he. Beat I don't off. think. I don't think, Leon. I know it. <laughs> no, but, okay. <laughs> but I've been quiet. Uh, so, Andrew, I had a question for you and some of the other hydrologists. And again, you can see from Dave's talk and Amil's comments, we're all collaborating. At, Obviously, we're interested in, in root soil interactions, amongst other things, but and there's the whole issue of scale. So the work you're doing, and maybe anybody else, I mean, do we have the tools, both the water measuring tools and the modeling tools to say focus on the first couple of feet the, uh, of soil that's you know surrounding the roots and focusing on water, water, you know, in fairly close proximity to the roots in terms of because uh, we can come up with say different uh, cultivars of a particular crop species that have different architectures and different and may perform differently in the lab and we want to test them in the field to see if some are more efficient say at acquiring water with lower soil moistures or acquiring different nutrients so just wondering what's what's out there particularly from the hydrology point of view uh, you know if we wanted to focus on the first you know on the on the on the root soil interface or the region of the soil around the roots you know. yeah well, I'll have a stab and then I'll ask Jay and, and Sarah to comment. I mean, I think I'm probably not going to tell you anything you don't already know that we're, we're, we're dealing with irreducible uncertainties with soil heterogeneity. So um, it's very challenging, um, but there are methods to measure soil moisture at large scales. Um, one of the methods we used at Keniston where Sarah's working or near where Sarah's working is um, a Cosmos instrument, which can measure like a 300 meter radius. Um, if you're talking about measurement. And then there are other methods as well. Uh, we could talk about those. Um, and then in terms of modeling, um, I think we do, we are getting better and better at modeling these systems. Um, and I, I think the, the challenge in the prairies is often, I think for me at least is the, is the frozen soil bit, that how does the water get in there in the beginning of the season? Um, so I think, I think, yeah, I do think that there are good, there's good progress there. And, and I think it would be interesting to try and, um, work with you on on using that in in a way that we hydrologists don't use it right hey just a quick question leon uh so i drifted while you were asking your question <laughs> were you talking about uh were you talking about uh large scale or were you talking about uh, basically you know uh, point scale local scale I, i'm thinking initially local scale and guess that won't yeah. take into account a lot of the heterogeneity but but initially yeah. you know, but ultimately we want to be able to apply it you know uh, I mean, we no, have found of course. that we've done at small scale, I mean, just through then testing yield and we, that we are having, you know, an impact on large scale, but right, but that's, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I would say that our methods are, you know, they're pretty strong at the, at the point scale for measured, for measuring, for monitoring. And that's one of the things I wanted to say after uh, Emil spoke about, about Dave's work. Uh, Dave, I thought you had left. Um, I'm going to send you a, Wait a message. Yeah. I don't know, I'll just tell you. Uh, so it's a great that. So I wonder. So I'm glad you're back because Emil commenting on your um, on your presentation, um, and it, you know relates to what Leon is asking about. So the answer to your question, Leon, is we can do a lot of stuff at uh, at the point scale, but we can do a lot of stuff um, at at bigger scales. We can make measurements across scales, and in listening to this group, measurements of different types. Um, and yeah, as they go up to bigger scales, there's there's more uncertainty and there's more problems with heterogeneity and so on. But but I think we have a you know a robust 
community here that can be looking at the right the soil root nutrient interactions using these different techniques whether they're imaging the stuff that Dave was talking about isotopes I can see Jeff is, has has uh, has shown his face so I think that means he probably wants to say something so I think there's a sh uh, uh, a shitload that can be yes, done yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might just comment briefly that um, I agree the potential is incredible, but going to Leon's question, I'd say there are still some major gaps in our understanding, Leon, and uh, our measurement capability. Uh, you know, the models Andrew's talking about, which are, which are really exciting, you know, we're still not getting to grips with preferential flow. And you go and uh, do a dye water application on any of our prairie soils in the summer, what do you see? Preferential flow. Similarly, root water uptake, the isotope work that I'll present in the, in the afternoon from, you know, open environmental systems, not controlled chambers, is still puzzling us. What's the role of mycorrhizal fungi, mucilage in facilitating these interactions we fundamentally don't understand some things. And I think that's an exciting uh, frontier where this group could come together, bringing kind of modeling tools, not just Andrew, but others have been referring to. That's where I get excited. We can go after real, uh, you know, fundamental gaps in our understanding. So- Yeah, I think that's great, yeah. Jeff. I think, you know, the questions, the uh, equipment, the people, you know, identify the unknowns, identify the knowns, identify the unknowns, what are the critical ones? I think that uh, would be a fun thing. Maybe we can talk about uh, this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I just want to- Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, I just want to say one other thing. I, you know, everything at some level is, is it can be looked at as a, uh, as a network of channels of some sort, like, like Dave does. Whether, whether, that's, whether that's your stuff, Dave, Jeff, or, uh, or roots, or 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 even above ground, um, and, and and so this 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 ability to assess and and identify complex structures with a with a single function um, has got some applications in all of our work, I think, and and that's uh, I'm I'm really excited about it. So I just wanted to make sure that that and and I'll be quiet, but I think it it it, it, it it's really neat. Cool. I agree. I think, um, thank you. I think uh, Chitra would like to say something. Uh, like answering the question for Leon, uh, measuring the water gradient in a soil core for modeling purpose, I don't know, magnetic resonance image, even the hospital here may be able to take big cores and it can map the water gradient, because, except that we have to reduce the iron content in the soil core. But uh, for modeling purpose, that may be a good start, right? Like you can have different soil systems and measure the water gradient. And then that's a low resolution. And then we should take that same core and take to the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron where we can image the porosity to look at the network. Because uh, petroleum extraction process have been modeled using CLS, porosity, porosity network. So with the Petroleum Institute in Regina, Canadian Light Source is doing, then they, send solvents, how the bubbles form, how the porosity, they are connected horizontally or vertical networks uh, in micron to nanoscale. So I think for modeling, these tools should be coupled. That's what I put the example, cyclotron, synchrotron, right? But we have these tools, but there should be one researcher at the higher level who, who can drive these tools to be combined together to answer these problems. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Andrew, uh, Christy has, uh, has politely uh, yes. asked it to uh, ask a question. Please, Christy. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I'm enjoying listening to all these, um, you know, diverse expertise and, and just thinking about how on earth are we going to make headway with, you know, 50 or 60 different um, uh, sort of disciplines and people and, and ideas. So just one thing that that has um, been something I've thought about for a long time is thinking about rather not our individual expertise, but rather think about like place, like individual farms and places where we collectively 
can work. Right now, it seems like we all have like network of places like study sites and so on. And we just do our intense detailed measurements on our, you know, using our amazing instruments, techniques, tools, et cetera. I know some people are working at very large scales and doing modeling over, you know, that don't work on study sites. I, I recognize that, but there seems to be very little layering um, going on or coordination. I mean, even within our own university, we have, you know, people working on university farm or, or, you know, areas like common research sites. And it's just, those are rich with opportunity for us to be layering the questions. And um, so I would like to just put forward, a, you know, an idea that we should really be coordinating that effort. Where are we working um, in a spatial sense? And, um, finding ways to kind of overlap from that point of view. And I know, Andrew, we did that a little bit with Prairie Water. We tried we, we tried that exercise a little bit. It didn't go very far. I think we got a bit tangled up in the weeds, but um, nonetheless, I think there's potential there. Uh, you know, I, so I think that's a great, uh, great comment, Christy. So that's something that I've actually talked uh, well, I think we've talked about it as a faculty, but certainly talked to Andrew about it, certainly talked to Jeff about it more recently about doing exactly that sort of uh um you know if you look on our web page you know we've got a bunch of stuff listed there but there's nothing sort of uh you know there's not a lot of cohesion i think it'd be great for us to be thinking about for example look at some of the sites that we're looking at in the saskatchewan river basin and call it a saskatchewan river basin hydrologic observatory what do we have what can we add to it that sort of thing jeff and i over the summer i can't remember jeff it's all a blur but we had a few discussions uh, about it. So it's also uh, so great idea. And so I think we should, you know, that is, I think, an important uh, action item that can come out of this uh, uh, workshop. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I've been, you know, I this, I've been thinking about how do we mine all this this wealth of of expertise because it can almost be too much. And this might be one way to put some infrastructure on that. So. Uh, um, so yeah, I think a great suggestion. Yeah. Um, you know, we, I think we also, it's fair to say, I don't want to speak for you, Jay, but I think we have capacity in the GIWS with, with some of our field technicians to support some of this work. Um, for example, I have a technician who's, um, <laughs> well, I have a technician who's, uh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> who does Saint Denis and, and, um, you know, if others wanted to, 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 to combine some of their work with that, then that would be No, but you know, I was just kind of laughing, Andrew, but, it, but it's true. I mean, that's part of the reason why we're here. We're paying, we're paying people, we're supporting people. And, and um, uh, I think we should probably be doing more so we can do a grassroots build up for sure. Uh, Dave yeah. was raising his hand. Did you see him, Andrew? Yeah, sure, Dave. Uh, so um, I, I would like to propose something that became evident to me when listening to Jeff's um, Schoenau's uh, presentation is that the, uh, the general theme of agricultural input management is something, you know, if you include the nutrients, pesticides, herbicides, those things, those, that theme connects economics, agriculture, toxicology, remote sensing, weather, um, hydrological modeling, big data analysis, um, I think that would be potentially a crystallizing uh, kind of uh, event uh, to, to maybe think about, uh, you know, a CFREF style uh, project across campus um, that, would, that would focus on that input management. Um, I think that would um, uh, organize our, our efforts in a, in a productive way. It would promote interactions across disciplines create opportunities for collaboration with industry um, and potentially, you know, deliver actionable information to producers and, and government agencies and other, other communities. In addition to the science impact, I think there's a lot of practical derivatives. Um, and that was really the biggest thing that I got out of these first two um, um, sessions was that there really is a possibility of having a cross campus activity that's bigger than any one individual or even any one institute um, to focus yeah. on a really big problem like managing input. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so I wanted to follow up on that, David, because I actually meant to. Uh, uh, Jeff, I think might have gotten off uh, quickly, but um, so I agree a hundred percent. Except that I would add water to that, and um, I think we need to be thinking about, you know, ag hydro, and and the same things that you just said, and the same thing that Jeff said actually about nutrient management, we say about water management. So that's really the, the purpose of this workshop is to be doing them jointly. And I wanted to go back to a couple of things that came up. Jeff used the term nutrient stewardship and I had never heard it before, like, right? And so it's like, use it or use it or lose it and figure out where it goes. So we do the same thing with water. So we should be doing those things together, right? Um, but just to hear him say nutrient stewardship, I'd never heard it before. Uh, but we talk about water stewardship all the time. And the other thing that Bobby said this morning that I meant to follow up on and, and didn't was she used the term soil memory. And in hydrology, we talk about soil moisture memory. And so those two things are gonna be interrelated. Um, and so, hi, Bobby. Uh, um, and so that's just another, you know, sort of overlap. Again, it's gonna be in this, in this uh, soil zone that we keep coming back to. But there's overlaps there. I think we need to start talking about, like I had never heard or even thought about soil memory before. Go ahead, Jeff. And I think, you know, building on what you're saying, this goes back to Christy's point, that if we were to have a place like a long-term ecological uh, research site, LTER in the US, or Andrew's been talking about a critical zone observatory, something that was place-based where we could all come together and learn to tell each other stories learn enough about what each other are doing from the results we're getting from this this area man that could be transformative i think as a as a campus and in terms of these interdisciplinary connections i've seen that happen at us universities with lter with critical zone in germany with torino their their network of terrestrial environmental observatories so i just wanted to support christie's uh useful point there earlier thank you jeff I, I, I'm wondering if other Jeff, Jeff Shono, would like to say anything, because I see you put your camera on there. Yeah, no, I just, uh, I think that whole integration is really important. And I guess I've, I've learned a lot and have gotten quite excited about the whole possibilities for remote sensing. And so I think tying that into what we're doing and, you know, what I'm doing on the sort of the ground level, the field scale or small plot, I think is really, really exciting and really important. So I hope that that type of effort can continue on to, to try and meld all these different things together because uh, that's what it's going to take to. And the LTR ER concept, I really like that too, a place where everybody can work uh, and uh, uh, some common sites that we really get some some good short term and also long term information on on what's going on and how we can can do the best job we can in uh, in managing it. Well, I, I was wondering if you were going to offer up your farm for that. Well, you know, it's it, it, it's one place. I have lots and lots of people come out and do all different kinds of things out there. So it's a pretty diverse landscape. It's a typical southern Saskatchewan knob and kettle. There's uh, wetlands. Uh, yeah, so it 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 gives a pretty good opportunity for uh, for uh, at least and I've and, and my students to have 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 worked on it and many others as well. So yeah, <laughs> indeed. Anybody who's looking for a site, uh, yeah, I'm always happy to entertain. I'll go one step further and I, I would advocate for the, the place-based approach, but um, you know, something I've been pushing for a few years is to have a network of farms across, for example, the Prairie region that represent the different uh, geographies as you, as I can't even remember who said it because we've had so many talks this morning, but somebody said, you know, it doesn't matter farmer and maybe it was UJ, like, or I don't know, someone had said in Alberta, you know, Northern Alberta doesn't care about sort of somebody's farm in southern Saskatchewan um, like it doesn't make it it doesn't it doesn't have any impact for them so what you really need if you want to improve sort of the relevance is you need and even from from a modeling point of view you need data that's that captures the variation right so so I do think we need to have kind of a network of of sites that um that we do similar things at. Um, and that that kind of is really only possible when you have a lot of people um, and a lot of capacity, right? It's never something that one uh, researcher can do. And so that's where I think there's a lot of power. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. think that's a good point. Also, you know, we have a lot of uh, colleagues that are farmers that can help us connect, right? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I I, sorry. Um, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, I, I, you know, he, there's a, two different themes here, the, the kind of location based kind of infrastructure and also as Dave was proposing maybe, you know, a, a theme and what Jay was talking about, you know, I could see something like tying together either a location or network of locations and I may Maybe we start with one. I don't know how that works because I work in a lab. But um, with, you know, I, I kind of like the idea of integrating water and nutrient stewardship, uh, you know, using some, some buzzwords because that's really what, you know, I know on the nutrient side, that's got to be shepherded. You know, it, 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 that's as important as, as you know, taking care of water. So I, I can see in that kind of an integrated theme with one or more locations where we conduct work together, you know, kind of like a, like a, um, a, 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 a field laboratory. So. Yeah, nice. Jay, how are we doing for time? Do you want to carry Oh, on? I think we should break. It was great <laughs> to let the conversation go, but we're going to restart at one. So people should take a break and rest their brains and get some food. <laughs>